I wanted to look at just a, a single verse this morning, single verse. So if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Matthew, and I want to read the whole story, but I really just want to zero in on a single verse of the Bible. So if you're four and five years old, I want you guys to listen too, okay? Because I'm going to be talking about Jesus, but I also want you guys to be paying attention to what I'm saying, all right? Four and five-year-olds, let me see your hands again. Are you back there? Raise your hands. All right, I'm, I'm talking to you as well. Now let's read the whole passage. This is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 18 through verse 25. Here we go. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. When I was um, growing up, my grandparents always lived far away from where we lived. So if your kids, how many of you kids have your grandparents that live close to where you live? Anybody have grandparents live close? And how many live grandparents, grandma and grandpa live far, far away? Anybody have far, far away grandpa and grandma? Yeah, that's right. Well, my grandpa and grandma lived far, far away, but they still wanted to send presents on Christmas. And the problem was they didn't want to just send one present at a time in the mail because it got more expensive. So they would send a box and inside the box, there were lots of little presents and the little presents were uh, for different people in the family. They might send a bunch of, bunch of presents that are all written with different names. At least they do that today with my kids as well. They still do. Well, this little verse we're going to look at today in the Bible is kind of like a box that is sent to a house and it has lots of little presents inside of it. Many little presents. So it's one verse, but it has a lot of gifts that you could unwrap inside. And there's three gifts that I'm going to talk about today. Because this verse is really like a package from God to us. It's a gift that he sent to us on Christmas Day. And inside are three different packages that we can unwrap. So let's look at this one verse there, verse 21 is the verse I'm talking about, and really it's just the second half of that verse. The second half of that verse that says, He will save his people from their sins. You can imagine when you go to the hospital, one of those banners over the doorways, it's a boy, or the shirts that they give, you know, siblings the big brother and my special little guy and all these kind of shirts. Well, the, the banner over Jesus' door was he will save his people from their sins. It was a prophetic promise of the mission of this baby. And the first gift that we unwrap about this promise is this one. Someone other than us has to save us. You notice that in that little verse, don't you? It's someone other than us. Who will save us from our sins? He will. Not you will, and not he will help you, but he will save his people from their sins. And, and this is really good news, and this is good news for every age. I don't care if you're 75 or you're seven years old. This is really good news. Because if you were told by the coming of Jesus, here's the big announcement. Jesus is going to be a messenger for God, and he's going to tell everybody how to save themselves from their sins. 
That could have been the announcement. It could have been that God sent a really special messenger, a prophet, a, a, a powerful preacher that stood up and said, I will now declare to you the good news. You can now save yourselves from your sins. Here's what you have to do. You have to measure up to the holiness of God. Good news. If only you do that, you can climb your way to heaven. It's possible for a person to not be estranged any longer from the maker, the, the God that made them. They can know him. They can love him. Here's the news. Just be holy like he is holy. I'll give you the instructions. That's why this is a gift. We, we open that box. My grandparents send these boxes to my children. They open it up, and there's a gift inside. First gift, number one. Who will save people from their sins? He will. Not you and not me. Now, that's good news, because if you look back at 2016, I'm sure you can think of many reasons why it would be very depressing if you had to save yourself from your sins. I was just over at my in-law's house the other day, and, um, and my little son reached out and he grabbed a little coffee cup and pulled it right off the table and dropped it on the floor. And it shattered as it would. And it was reminding me of how it is like that in our relationship with God over and over and over again. God presents us with his holiness and a relationship with mankind and in our sin. We reach out and grab that relationship and we promptly drop it on the floor. And you know it as well as I do, when you have that kind of a, a shattering moment, it, it can't be rebuilt the same. It's, it's shattered, it's gone, it's broken. That's what our life is like toward God. Maybe well-intentioned. Maybe we started last year, 2016, with a lot of great intentions about godliness and reading the whole Bible through in a year and loving our spouse better and all kinds of marvelous intentions. But, but ultimately, there was a lot of shattering moments too. And even for Christians, well, certainly we made some progress, but there was plenty of shattering moments to go around. Oh, kind of moments. Oh, I'm so sorry, kind of moments. Oh, I can't believe I did that again kind of moments. Well, that's why this present that we unwrap every Christmas in a particular way, as though it's given to us for the first time, is freshly needed. It's why Christmas never gets old. Oh, presents. I, I really can't get excited about presents this year. I don't care how old you are. You still get excited about present unwrapping on Christmas morning. Well, the greatest present is this package that gets unwrapped. Here's the good news. God does not intend any person to save themselves from their sins to rebuild a broken cup. He, he, and he alone will save his people from their sins. That's the first package. Now, kids, how many of you, if you got a big box in the mail and there were a package in there with your name on it, would be really excited? That'd be fun, right? And here it comes in the mail from grandpa and grandma. It's a package and you can unwrap it and there's a present. But guess what? After you unwrap that package, there's more packages in there. There's more. And you can look at your mom and dad with wide eyes. Grandpa and grandma sent us more than one present. Well, this verse has more than one present too. He, he will do it. Not you, not you. You will not save yourselves from your sins. He will do it. But here's the second gift that's present. He will save you. He will save you from your sins. Let's think for a moment. Sometimes I find it helpful when we're reading the Bible to think what other words could have been present in a verse and how much better news it is that they're not. So this is an example of that, all right? So if you substitute other words in this verse, the glory of the gift starts to unpack for you. He will help them with their sins. He will make up the difference for their sins. He will ignore their sins. He will be an example where they can stop committing sins. 
All of those words would fall short of what the word is that God gives to us, that we unwrapped. He will save his people from their sins. That, that word, it, it pictures someone in a hopeless, desperate condition that they can't climb out of that they can't reach out of. And it's a bad condition. This isn't uh, merely aid, a little bit of, of extra cash at the end of the year. This, this isn't like a, a little pick-me-up. This isn't caffeine halfway through your day. He will help you because you just can't quite get it done. This isn't Jesus coming to us halfway through a huge load of laundry and saying, wow, that was a big load. Let me help you finish that. This isn't Jesus coming to you at the end of your workday and saying, I know you're really tired, but let me give you a little more strength to make it through to five o'clock. This is Jesus coming to us when we're at the bottom of the ocean under an ocean liner and chained to an anchor and saying, let me take you to heaven. He will save you from your sins. Remember, this is the banner over the door. If there had been a hospital, it would have been the banner over the door at the hospital as it was. It hung over the stable. He will save you. What will this boy do? He will save you. Jesus, if there was a heavenly vote, was voted definitely the one who will save people from their sins. Salvation is the message of Christmas. Salvation. Isn't that a wonderful word? Salvation. It, it, it pictures being lifted up out of despair and hopelessness. It pictures being, being taken out of this, this desperate prison and set free. It, it pictures the Israelites in bondage and slavery and having to make bricks without straw and under a cruel taskmaster and God lifting them out of that and setting them in a promised land. It pictures God's Old Testament people. Remember when they were overcome by the Midianites that were like a horde, it said, this, this horde of enemy soldiers, and somehow God destroys the army and sets them free. It, it pictures the Israelites on the edge of the Red Sea when they have the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army coming towards them with their spears and their chariots ready to run them into the sea, and, and suddenly God parts the waves, and they walk through on dry ground, and then just as they get through to the other shore, the army of the Egyptians comes in, and, and the waves crash over them, and their enemies are destroyed. Th that's what that word brings to mind. He will save you. Not help you out, not polish you up, not fix a few mistakes. He will save you with all of the permanence that comes to mind with that word, all, all of the assurance, all of the guarantee, all of the sense of rescue and, and delightful exuberance of, a, of a, an army that has won the victory, except in this case, the army didn't do anything. Suddenly, the battlefield is swept clean. The enemy's defeat has been guaranteed. It's been accomplished by someone else. The final victory has been assured. It's been declared saved. That's the second package we unwrap, but that's not, that's not the last package. He will save his people, it says, from their sins. Now, here's where it gets really surprising. Have you ever gotten a, a present on Christmas that wasn't just beneficial, but it revealed that the person giving the present knows you so well? Aren't those the best presents? The presents where somebody you open and you think, you know me so well. I didn't even ask for this, but you know exactly what I needed. Well, this present reveals that, and it reveals it in a shocking way. It reveals, here's what the, the, the fact that Jesus will save them from their sins reveals. It reveals that Jesus knows us so well, and looking inside of us, he sees the ultimate thing we need to be saved from, and here's why this, it's so surprising. It's hatred of him. It's disobedience to him. It's disregard of him. 
that has caused there to be a breach between God who loves us and we who hate him. And since God is holy and is not just some Santa Claus who doesn't care what happens amongst his people, he will punish sin, but sin initiates this breach with God. And the people that Jesus sees on earth are covered and mired in this disposition towards him where they disregard him, don't think about him, and could care less what he wants to do with their lives. And this is the condition that is the most fundamental need that they have. When he sees us, he knows us very well. Jesus looks out on the earth and he sees quiet sinners. He sees secret sinners. He sees five-year-olds who disobey their parents. He sees men who hide. He sees women who lie. He sees marriages that are angry. He sees relatives that fight. He sees pride and envy and idolatry and above all, godlessness. Living life as though there is no God. And seeing all of those people, here's what he does. Christmas present for those that hate me I'll give myself and I'll give myself for their sins I'll save them because their sins need saving Someone has to die for them, so I'll give myself. So when we unwrap this box, we find the final package. Here's the surprising good news of Christmas. Here's the good news that every Christian needs to remember every day. We never grow out of this. We never outgrow the need to be freshly affected and impacted by this. And every Christian that I know, including myself, becomes bored and familiar with this same story. And so we have to unwrap this gift as though it were for the first time. And remember again, Jesus saved us, how? From our sins, because we needed to be saved from God's judgment because of our hatred of him. And so he sent himself. Isn't it interesting to you that when, when Jesus is announced as a baby, the thing the angel wants Mary to understand, the mystery that he most wants her to get is, look, here is the big deal, Mary. Here's the thing you must imprint on your heart. Here's the banner over his newborn door. He will save his people from what? From the Romans? No, I mean, not primarily. From the Greeks? Not primarily. From suffering and pain? Well, yes, but not primarily, not fundamentally. Here's what the angels want you to know. He will save his people, surprise, from their sins. Jesus gets to the very bottom of who you are at your very absolute worst. He gives himself and rescues us from the judgment of God. That's the banner over his door. He will save his people from their sins. So when you read the verse backwards, it makes it all the more amazing. From their sins, those things that were in defiance of God, he will do what? He will save them. He will rescue them completely. He will deliver them utterly. He will remove them completely from the consequences of their sin. He will save them. And the final beginning package makes even more sense. He will do it. From their sins, save them, he will. What a package. What a package that is. What news that is. He, Jesus Christ, will save you from your sins if you receive him.
Friends, we must not grow familiar with the good news of Jesus Christ. This year, as we head into 2017, I guarantee it, January 1, there's going to be some desire in our hearts to save ourselves from our sins. There's going to be some forgetfulness that he saves us from our sins. Or there's going to be some neglect of the idea that we need to be saved from our sins. But we can't forget this good news. This is the good news. This is why we celebrate Christmas. This is why we gave gifts this morning. This is why we give gifts to one another. I tell my children, it's Jesus' birthday and we get presents. Because that's exactly what the gospel is like. Jesus was born and we get the benefit. Jesus died and we get eternal life. Jesus suffered and we get to be saved. Jesus was denied by God and we get to be lifted up. Jesus was judged and we were rescued. Jesus was forsaken and we are forgiven. That is the good news of Christmas. That's the exchange. And it's encapsulated on Christmas. It's Jesus' birthday and we get the presents. Good news. Good news. Package unwrapped. The package must be unwrapped every day. For a Christian, every day should be like Christmas Day, where we unwrap the package of the gospel again. We remember again all three presents. He saves from our sin. We have a tradition as a church that the last message of the year will be a message of gratefulness. We'll talk about Thanksgiving, because I, I think Thanksgiving is one of the secrets of a faithful Christian life. Well, this year, the calendar uh, threw a curveball, and the last Chris Sunday was on Christmas Day, and I thought, well, we can't not do a Christmas message on Christmas Day. There's got to be some rule against that in the pastoral handbook somewhere. Um, so we didn't do that. Um, but what I wanted to do was close our meeting with just offering up a, a few moments of thanksgiving to God. First, for those, those of us that have believed in Jesus, that he saved us, but then secondly, for his faithfulness and goodness to us this last year. So what I want to do is just take a, a couple of minutes as families and if you don't have a family, uh, somebody will adopt you, okay? So just turn around and welcome to your new parents. There they are. Um, they will find a gray-haired person and, and tell them mom or dad, and they'll pray with you. Um, and we just want to take five minutes, and let's pray together. Let's begin somebody on behalf of the group. Let's thank the Lord Jesus for coming to save us from our sins. And then each person in the group just offer one, one thing that you're grateful for that God has done this last year. Um, if you're a guest with us, please don't feel pressure to pray. This is for the members of the church. Um, but let's just take five minutes, and then I'll call us back together, and we'll pray together to, to close. Lord Jesus, we come into the final week of this year celebrating your goodness to us. First and foremost, foremost Lord, through the gospel, through the giving of yourself, the person of the Son, to save us. We thank you for the grace that you have lavished on our lives. We thank you that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you that we know you. We thank you that more importantly you know us we thank you for the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Lord, we thank you for the assurance that you will preserve and keep us through the year to come by your grace and for your glory. Receive the glory for all that has taken place in our lives individually, as families, and as a church family this year. We give you the glory for it all. May it resound in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.